Well, church, I am bringing you the word this morning, and I am excited. Right before we begin, I want you to check out this very brief video. Oh, love that sound. Vroom, vroom. That is this little uh, motorbike right here, little pocket dirt bike. It's 47 cc's. It was uh, given to my kids at the end of the summer. Uh, a friend of ours gave it to us. It was broken for a very long time, and it had actually not been running for many years. Now, I am not mechanical. I have never been a mechanical person but I thought, you know, maybe I'll be able to fix it. And I went online, it wasn't very difficult, Google, YouTube, and I learned that with these little 47, 49 cc engines, when they've been sitting around for a long time, the main culprit for them not wanting to start is usually has to do with a carburetor, which is this little thing right here. Uh, the, the, the fuel tank sits here, this is the fuel line, it goes into the carburetor, this is another carburetor, and what happens is, is there is this little jet that the gas passes through, and the opening is about the width of a tiny little needle, and it gets plugged up. So what I learned online is 80% of the time to get these old machines running again, sometimes all you got to do is just put your lips on this little tube that goes into the carburetor and blow as hard as possible. So sure enough, I saw that, I went out to the bike and put my lips on that little thing, it was kind of nasty, and I just blew, and then I pulled the starter cord, and what do you know, next thing, it started up. I was so stoked. I cannot even begin to describe to you in that moment the joy that I was feeling. To think that I had the breath of life and I breathed into this thing and it just roared into existence. I mean, I, was, I, was, I, I became instantly obsessed. To very much to my wife's dismay, I started to pick up these little pocket dirt bikes, these little engines, and I got deeper and deeper into it. I, I started loving it. I started loving restoring it, taking them apart, learning it. some of them had deeper problems. And, and I just, I was fascinated with this. I graduated to mopeds and, and a scooter, and, and, and all winter I was kind of doing this stuff. Uh, you know, my house was smelling like gasoline, which didn't go over very well with Esther. I don't know why my wife doesn't like the smell of gasoline. Me and the boys coming that, down to that in the morning I, it was quite pleasant. Anyway, I've learned not to do that. But, but, but here's the point. I love this so much that it was, I was seriously questioning God as to why I love this so much. I was like, Lord, why am I obsessed with restoring these old things so much? And that's when it hit me. It's because I'm, I'm made in the image of someone who is really into restoration. See, I don't know if you know this, but God is a God of restoration, and we are made in that image. And, and the gospel, the good news, is that he wants to restore you. He wants to restore all people. That's why Jesus came, and it's everywhere in the Bible. It's from the very first book, in the very first page of the Bible to the very end. You got Adam and Eve. They are fallen. What does God promise? That he will restore them. You have the flood, destruction, but then what does God say? That's not the end of the story. No, I'm going to restore humanity. And then you've got this, the, the, the history of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. They're in slavery in Egypt, and what does God promise? I am going to restore you to the promised land. And then you have the kingdom of Israel and Judah and, and the glorious kingdom on earth there. And, 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 but God says if you're bad, you're going to be sent into exile. Sure enough, it happens. But what does God promise? That even if you are in exile, I will restore you. And then enter Jesus. And what do you see in every chapter of the New Testament. Jesus is going around restoring people. Blind people, he restores their sight. Mute people begin to speak. Deaf people begin to hear. He restores the, the, the brokenness inside of people, outside of people. And the final brokenness that he restores is death itself. He restores the dead, brings us to life. The book of Revelation ends with this beautiful picture of all, all, all of God's creation being renewed, restored, heaven coming to earth. That is our destiny. It is on page one, and it is on the last page. He is a God of restoration. But hear me out, church. Restoration is promised to God's people, anybody that wants it, but it is not guaranteed. It is not guaranteed because there were Israelites who stayed in the desert, never saw the promised land. There were people in exile who stayed in exile. They never, they never received. There were people in Jesus' day who could have came to him 
And they never received the restoration that he wanted. And and that is not God's will for any of his children. So today, I want to give you some principles on restoration. And let's face it. Let's be honest. A lot of us, in the last year, we've we've lost. There is some some brokenness that has occurred during COVID-19. And we are in need of a little bit of restoration. So I'm going to look at one classic story in the Bible. This is the story of Nehemiah, or Nehemiah, as I like to say. uh, Because from my background, that's how we pronounce it. So if I pronounce it weird, I apologize now. Uh, Nehemiah, let's put the book in context. Israel was nasty. You had King David, and that was the golden era of Israel, and God promised that he would bless them as long as they obeyed his commands, but as long as they followed his way, stayed away from wickedness. But then Solomon came into the picture, and things were great, but then slowly, king after king after king, Israel was naughty, and just as God promised, he said, if you're going to be naughty, I'm going to send you into my room. There is going to be a punishment. You're going to need a timeout. So the timeout came. This superpower at the time in the world was Babylon, mighty, wicked empire. And they came in, and what did they do? They squashed Jerusalem. They trampled on it, destroyed it. They took a ton of people back into Babylon, into captivity. But through the prophets, God said, after 70 years, I will restore you to this place. So the book of Nehemiah takes place at the end of that 70-year period. Nehemiah's brother had just been to Jerusalem, and so he's come back, and Nehemiah is curious, so he asks him about it, and that's where we pick up. It's written in the first person. So Nehemiah says, Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. Well, they said to me, the remnant there in the promised who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now, I can just imagine that that Nehemiah, along with a a, a lot of the Israelites that were in the Babylonian captivity, that they probably heard stories of the greatness, the grandeur of, of Jerusalem and Judah and the times of David and Solomon. And here he gets this devastating report from his brother who basically says, dude, it sucks. So, so, so what happens? How does Nehemiah react? Let's read. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I want to pause here for a moment and look at a few things that need to happen in any restoration process. Here's the first. There is an awareness of the brokenness. Nehemiah was made aware of the need for restoration. And and can I just say that the same has to occur for you and I. We, We need to be truthful about the fact that there is some brokenness in our lives, that there is a wall that has come down where our defenses are down and the enemy has come in. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe maybe it's your love for the Lord. Maybe it's not what it once was. Maybe you're stuck in some habitual sin and it's, and it's holding you back. Here's the thing. You need to be truthful about that. Have an awareness of it. Because why? They say, and this is a true saying, they say that you can't help someone who doesn't think they need help. And the New Testament is a perfect example of that. Who are the people that uh, thought they had it all together? The religious establishment. There were these religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and and Jesus wanted to restore. Those were the people that were needing restoration the most, but they they were self-righteous. I don't need him. No, no, I've got it all together. I've got everything. I am good. So who did Jesus restore? The people that admitted, that were aware, that were truthful about their own brokenness. The sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collector, the, the, the people who, who knew that they were broken inside. Those are the people that Jesus came to. Those are the people that Jesus touched. We need to be aware and truthful of our own brokenness. That's the first step. The second is, you got to get upset about it. There's a lot of people who are aware that they're broken in some area, but they're indifferent to it. They could, they could care less. They learn to live with it. Nehemiah was not indifferent. When he was made aware of the brokenness, it says he grieved. He grieved for for, for days, night and day. He was bothered by it. But here's the thing. He didn't just roll up in a little ball and just wallow in self-pity and say, oh, it sucks, life sucks. Life." What did he do with his grief? Which, by the way, is a healthy thing. Can I just stop? You know who grieved in the New Testament and it 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 was not a lack of faith? Jesus. 
Jesus also grieved in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Like, like it is okay to grieve. I'm not saying don't grieve. What I'm saying is do what Jesus did, do what Nehemiah did. What did they do with their grief? They poured it out unto God. God can handle your grief. He wants you to be grieved about the thing that's broken in your life and direct the grief at him because by doing so, it becomes prayer. And that's the next thing that we read in, in Nehemiah. He, 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 he prayed and he fasted. His grief was turned into prayer. It became this thing that he wanted to share with the Lord. The Lord can handle your burden. He wants you to burden him with, with your grief. And, and there's one other word here we read in Nehemiah. This is what he did. He, he prayed and he what? He fasted. He fasted. And can I just say that this is an important tool in restoration. Not just some random fast because, oh, I'm going to be really religious and I'm going to be fast. You can fast with purpose when it comes to restoration. Why is this so important? Because very often there are things that are going to distract us from the restoration that are going to kind of numb the pain of having this brokenness. And you know what? That's the thing you should fast from. That you should fast from something so you can focus on getting serious, on getting desperate about your restoration. So if it's pornography, right, maybe a good idea is to fast from screens for a while until God puts you on a path for restoration. Here's the last thing in Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, Nehemiah 1, 8 to 10. Here's the last thing that he brings into it in this chapter. He says this. He's talking to God. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place, as a dwelling for my name. What does Nehemiah do? He reminds God of his own promises. He believes God's words. He clings to the, to, the, to, to the word, to the scriptures that speak to the restoration, and that's what you and I have to do. We have to get into the word and get to those promises, get to those places where God promises restoration in that particular area of your life. Let me give you a practical example of how that might look. Let's say during COVID-19, let's say it's anger. You know, this is a very real thing that is happening right now, right? We've been in close quarters. We're angry at the government. We're angry at life. And, and we, we take that anger out at the people that we love the most. And, 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 and here's the thing. If, 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 for example, if that was your thing, then, man, I, I, I need to be made aware of the fact that that's happened to me, that my, the wall of peace has come down in my life. And then i got to get upset about it. I'm not going to be content with just being an angry person all the time. And I'm going to grieve about it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour that grief out before the Lord. That's what he wants me to do because he wants to direct me. And, and, then, and then I'm going to even fast because I'm going to get serious about it. So I'm going to fast from something until I deal with this issue in my life, until God helps me. And then I'm going to look in the scriptures. And it's so easy in this day and age. I mean, you could just Google Bible verses on anger. And then, and then I'm going to look up all these verses that, that, that prompt that anger does not achieve the righteousness of God and, and promises of deliverance, how God helps those humble himself and draw near to me. I'll draw, I, there's so many. And then I'm going to start believing them, clinging to them. And can I just tell you something, church? Sometimes that's enough. Sometimes that's all you need to do to be restored in a certain area in your life. It's like me grabbing that little engine and God just, God just blowing in life. It's a small tune-up to get you revving again, to get you going. But sometimes, it's not enough. It wasn't enough in this particular. Sometimes the restoration has to go a little bit deeper. What do I mean? Let me unpack this by continuing to look at Nehemiah. Okay, so he worked for the king of Babylon. He was a cupbearer in his court. And, and a few days later, he comes into the king's presence, and he's sad. He can't hide the fact that he's broken up about this, right? And so, uh, let's go here to verse 2. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. That is actually what the king of Babylon sounded like. I did a ton of historical research, so I'm just letting you know that um, I am not fabricating anything. That was almost identical to what the king sounded like. And Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What is it you want? 
Then I prayed to the God of heaven, always praying this guy, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. I want to focus on verse 2. What does it say there? That he was very much afraid. He was very much afraid to be vulnerable with the king, to share the truth about the brokenness. And does that sound familiar? Isn't, isn't that true for a lot of us? It's really difficult to be vulnerable with other people. We're, we're, we're very good at uh, asking. You know, Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. And, and asking the Lord for help, I mean, all of us, we're very good at that. You know, we're, ah, Lord, I really need help with this thing. And we'll even seek. I mean, that's, we'll, we'll go into the scriptures, we'll look for an answer, but then sometimes God wants us to knock on a door. And that takes courage. Why? Because we feel shame. We're embarrassed. We feel stupid. Or we feel fear, like Nehemiah. It takes courage, but it's necessary. And I'll tell you why. Because very often, God will use another person in your restoration process. Sometimes the miracle is actually who God uses. Like in this example, it was a, a pagan king, and sometimes it's not even going to be a Christian. I don't know who God will direct it to you. We all want the quick fix. We all want God to just, you know, blow in our carburetors. But the truth is, sometimes we have to get vulnerable. We have to be courageous. It could be, it could be a, a pastor. It could be a friend, a parent, a spouse. It could be a policeman. I don't know who it is in your context, but this I do know, that if you're serious about restoration, you're praying, you're fasting, you're seeking, the Lord will direct you to someone. And then this is important. When, when you get that godly wisdom, that instruction, it is time to get your hands dirty. That's when, that's when a real work might begin, where you got to start taking things apart and diagnosing and going a little bit deeper. And, and here's what you can expect when you begin to do that. Look at the story of Nehemiah one more time. He gets to Jerusalem. You know, the, the king is granted that. He gets there, and there are some Jews who are already there who stayed behind. They've been living in the garbage dump that is Jerusalem for a while. And then he tells them about how the king has been favorable. In, in, in uh, chapter 2, verses 17 to 20, 18 to 20, we read, I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me, and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. So they said then, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success, therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. What's the first thing that you can expect when you actually start doing the thing that God wants you to do in your restoration process? You can expect opposition. They mocked and they despised him. You can expect that the enemy is going to come in and he's going to try to bring you down, discourage you, distract you. Why? Because the enemy does not want you building up, restoring the area of your life that he brought down. So let me give you an example. Let's say you, 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 you've lost in the area of finances, okay? A lot of people over the last year, financially, it's been difficult. A wall has come back down. God wants to restore us to a place of security. And, and when, we, when we're made aware of this, right, and we're broken up about it, and instead of wallowing in self-pity, I am going to take my grief out onto the Lord, pray, and, and, and fast, and maybe even get counsel on how we can get back on track about, uh, maybe I, I hear from somebody I trust about budgeting and, and being generous and, and all the things that the scriptures say, and then I go about doing it and suddenly the enemy comes in and or somebody comes in they say you can't do it you, you know it works for other, it's not going to work for you it, you're, you're not smart enough you're not good whatever it is that the enemy says this is what i want you to do i want you to say exactly what nehemiah said in verse 20 so i answered them and said to the naysayers to the enemy the god of heaven will give us success therefore we his servants will arise and build if it's your marriage and you start working on it and you get distracted or discouraged or your family or, or you, your, your physical strength or, or I don't know what it is in your life that needs rebuilding. But when the enemy comes and tries to stop you, memorize this verse. 
Write it on your wrist, on your mirror. Put it to memory and say it every day. No, I'm going to personalize it. The God of heaven will give me success. Therefore, I, his servant, will arise and build. I am getting my hands dirty. God has promised me success. I will arise and build. I will not let anything stop me. And I will also know this. This is the next thing you need to know. You are not alone. Restoration is completed in community. You don't have to go about this battle by yourself. And, and, and in chapter 3 of Nehemiah, we see this. There is this magnificent list of all the people who put their hands to rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And this is the most boring chapter in Nehemiah by far, but I love it because this is what it spoke to me. This is the, this is the anyone can do it list. See, anyone can participate in restoration. And, and, and in this chapter, you have, and there was uh, uh, the priest, and there was, a, there was a tradesperson, there was a jeweler, there was some guy and his daughters, I mean, anybody. And it just says, and this person was next to that person, and that person was next to that person, and they were all building this wall together. What a beautiful image for what the church is like. Because we're all broken. All of us have brokenness in our lives. But, but what happens when we come together and we start building up our little section of the wall. We start, you know, I'm encouraged by you if, if I get weak. You're encouraged by me. Yeah, the enemy is hurling insults if you read the story. But you know what? Uh, some of us, we have weapons in our We're ready and we're, we're, we're united. We are strong. And together, as we all build our little bit, as we take restoration of our own lives seriously and help one another, the church becomes strong. We're united we need each other, and it is worth it. Let me tell you why this is worth it, when we all do this together. Because the rest of Nehemiah, you have this beautiful description of what happens when all the people come together to work on brokenness. In chapter 6, the walls are complete. And what happens when everybody finishes their little bit, the walls are complete? It's this, this beautiful verse that says this, the enemies lost their confidence to attack. In chapter 7, the city grows. All these people come back into the walls. In chapter 8, revival breaks out. The Word of God comes alive again. Chapter 9, new songs are created. Festivals are reinstituted. The Sabbath is reinstituted. Do you see that there is a season of rest? There is a season of joy. There is a glory that comes when we take restoration seriously, when we all start doing it. This is what the Lord wants for us. That's the end goal of restoration for me and you. It's not just personal revival. Bible. It's the revival of the church of Jesus Christ. We come alive. You were made to run. You were made to roar your engine, make a noise, go somewhere to do the will of God. Some of us in the church, we've gotten really good. We've gotten really good at just restoring the outside. You know, this little engine, when I bought it, it was completely seized up. It was covered in rust. This was by far the worst one. And I could have just focused on the outside. I got pretty good at that, you know, repainting things, stripping rust off. And, and a lot of us, we're, we're pretty good at the outside stuff. But look, this is the thing right here that makes it run, the heart, the soul. And that's what God wants us to work on. We do, we, 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 we do not want to just be Christians that, that sit in the pews and look pretty and have this outward appearance of, of holiness and godliness. He wants us to run. You were made to run in Jesus' name. So this morning, what I believe God is saying, I believe he is in, inviting you to come into the hands of the master mechanic. Come into God's garage and let him bring you to life again. And I, let me encourage you. I promise you, you have what it takes to do this. You can do this. The God of heaven will give you success. You, his servant, arise and build. I'm going to use this illustration here, this final illustration. This little engine, I learned, needs three things to roar, to run. And it's similar to us. The first thing it needs is spark. This is the spark plug. And at the end of this little plug, when the engine cranks, it lights up. There is this spark. There is this light. There is this power. And that's Jesus. And I know that Jesus lives in you. If you, if you are a Christian, if you follow Christ, he is inside you. 
Look at that. It goes right there into the darkness, and it brings light and power. That's just like Jesus in us. The second thing that I know you have is the Word. This little engine, it needs fuel. And the Word of God, that's our daily bread. It is the fuel. And so as long as fuel is getting into this engine right here, it's going to run. And you have the Word of God. You're listening to this right now. You're receiving the Word of God. You have a Bible. You have it in your phone. You have a physical one. You have the Word of God. And the, in these little two-stroke engines, the, the fuel has to be mixed with oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit everywhere in the Scripture. So, so, so here's the thing. Some of us, we got into this religious habit of maybe you know, reading even the Bible verse a day or, or once in a while or something like that. But, but what we're missing is the, this engine... If it just runs on fuel with no oil, it will burn out. And a lot of you out there, you're burning out. And I, can I just tell you, it's because you need to add Holy Spirit into the mix. It is Jesus who lives inside you, mixing with the Word of God and the Spirit of God that brings this to life. Vroom, vroom. And here's the last thing. So yeah, I know you have those things, but here's the last thing that you need. This little engine needs compression, which just means that it's airtight. See, there's all these different components that sort of come together. And there's these little seals everywhere, and the, and the piston needs to be tight in the cylinder. And, and when, when something, when there's a little breach, when something's not right, too much air gets in, and it loses its power. And that's what I'm talking about today. Too much air coming in to some area of your life. There's some little wedge, there's some little doorway that the enemy has created. There's some wall that is down, and here's what, here's, what we're, here's what God is saying today. If you fix that little thing, if you take restoration seriously, you've already got Jesus, you've got the Spirit, you've got the Word. If you get airtight, if you close that door, you will run. God wants you to run. How do I know this? I'm, I'm preaching this this morning with confidence, not in arrogance, in confidence. I, I know that God is inviting you to restoration this morning. And you know how I know? This message has been burning in my heart for months. And about a month ago when I sat down to finally write the first draft of it, going through the Bible and, and really thinking it, the, the, almost the moment I was done, my telephone rings in the office. And it's the sister on the line who calls me maybe once or twice a year. I mean... It's not very often at all. And she randomly calls me to start telling me this incredible story that uh, her stepson, so her husband's son, had just visited them and they were estranged from him. They haven't seen the, the, the boy in five or six years. So he comes to the house and the father starts just apologizing apologizing to the son, and then they get to a point where he, where, where he asks the son, he says, son, can I pray a father's blessing over you? And the son agrees. The father puts his hand on the boy, and he just starts praying blessing over him, and suddenly the boy is in tears, the father is in tears, the stepmom is in tears, everyone is crying, and then, and then the most beautiful thing she said, they, they just embraced these two grown men crying, but reunite, and, and here's what she said, and this blew my mind. I had goosebumps all over. She said, Arthur, it was a complete restoration. She said those words. I had goosebumps everywhere because I had just finished all morning working on a sermon on restoration, and here, someone in the church calls me to talk about this incredible restoration testimony. And then it occurred to me just this morning, actually, that that father is a mechanic, I mean, people, God is speaking this morning. This is what I believe he's saying. He wants to duplicate these sort of stories all across the church. In this particular family, it was a relationship. I don't know what it is in your life, but I do know this. God wants you to run. 2021 is the year of restoration. I believe stories like this are going to be flooding into the church. The God of heaven will give you success. You, his servant, arise and build. We are a community. It happens in community. That's why we stress there are small groups all throughout the week on Zoom. We might not be able to get together physically. Call someone. Listen, you're not in this alone if you have an awareness of your brokenness. Get upset over it. Get grieved over it. But do not wallow in that grief. Turn it to the Lord. Turn it into prayer. 
Get serious, start fasting from stuff, turn to the scriptures, use it as a weapon. That might be all it takes, but if it's not, go to somebody you trust. Get godly counsel, get godly wisdom, find the courage to do what is being asked of you. And when the enemy comes to discourage you, Nehemiah 2.20, the God of heaven will give you success. You, his servant, arise and build. 2021 has robbed us of a lot of things. 2020. But what's coming up next, church, I believe this with all my heart, is a season of restoration. Get your motor running and head out on God's highway for the adventure he has for you. In Jesus' name, amen.